Hey! Today's lesson is called The Sixth Extinction, and the reason why is there have been major extinction events throughout the history of Earth and life. Uh, and right now, uh, scientists say that we're actually in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. So let's get into it and learn a little bit more. So, uh, first of all, let's define extinction. Extinction means it's no longer in existence. <coughs> So when we're talking about an animal, it means that that animal no longer is alive anywhere. It's extinct. So some information about this from the World Wildlife Fund to talk about how much extinction is taking place. Just to illustrate the degree of biodiversity loss we're facing, let's take you through one scientific analysis. The rapid loss of species we are seeing today is estimated by experts to be between 1,000 and 10,000 times higher than the natural extinction rate. These experts calculate that between 0.01 and 0.1% of all species will become extinct each year. If the low estimate of the number of species out there is true, uh, that there are around 2 million different species on our planet, then that means between 200 and 2,000 extinctions occur every single year. But if the upper estimate of species numbers is true, that there are 100 million different species coexisting with us on our planet, then between 10,000 and 100,000 species are becoming extinct each year. And all that is, is the 0.01 or the 0.1%, and then using the number of how many species are actually existing. So let's talk about different causes of extinction. Why are things going extinct? And the way that we remember this is with the acronym of HIPPO. So the H for HIPPO is habitat destruction. Uh, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. As we get more and more people, we are destroying habitat, things like, for example, the rainforest. And it's not just for houses or space for people to live. Most of this actually has to do essentially with like farming and agriculture. Um, so, you know, cattle, that sort of thing for grazing lands. Uh, so habitat destruction is a major issue. Introduced species, we're going to talk more about that one, uh, but it's essentially when we introduce a species that doesn't normally actually exist in that particular place. And as a result, it just wreaks havoc on that ecosystem. P, population. The population of humans is skyrocketing, or at least it was. And so as a result, as population goes up and up and up, there's less room and resources specifically for species, other species besides good us humans, right? All of us humans. Uh, pollution is an issue as well. So higher pollution means that basically things essentially can't survive because of the large amounts of pollutants that end up poisoning them and killing them and so on. Then another problem is overhunting of different things. So with overhunting, we have extinction and that's obviously a huge problem for like large mammals. Okay, so let's get into this. Let's talk about introduced species a little bit more, also called invasive species. Uh, these are things not native to a specific location and it causes damage to the environment, human economy, or human health. Great example is the Eastern Gray Squirrel. So especially like for a, an introduced species, what happens is that it's introduced to an ecosystem where it isn't normally there. And as a result, there's no predators, right, for that thing. Uh, nothing's adapted to actually hunt and kill that particular species. So the population of an introduced species just goes completely and totally out of control. And then that completely uses up resources because the things that get introduced, the species that gets introduced, it's still going to eat stuff. It's going to use resources. And essentially, it um, fills a niche that other uh, organisms normally filled and then there's no room for the other organisms. So it kind of just completely takes over. And because there's no uh, predators or anything to keep it in check, the population of an introduced species can go completely just out of control. Zebra mussels is a huge one. Uh, plants, you can have introduced species that are plants that end up coming in and then again, they just grow like crazy um, in an area and then other stuff can't survive because they don't have the space or the resources. Talking about the human influence, since humans have found better ways of producing food, uh, treating and preventing illnesses, the population of the world is just increasing faster than it ever used to. And our population is just insane as humans. So if we take a look at the next slide, this is actually uh, how the world has grown over time. So we were at 1 billion humans on Earth in 1803, and now we're all the way up to, uh, you know, 
essentially 7.7 .7 billion in 2019, almost 8 billion. So that's an eight times increase in, you know, essentially two centuries, right? If you take a look at this huge growth that we're looking at here, uh, I mean, 2 billion to almost 8 billion in 80 years, just insane, insane. I guess it's more like 90 years, but you get the idea. It's been massive population growth. Um, it is expected that it's going to slow down as time goes on. And I mean, it's going to need to. Um, and that, you know, partly is just because the resources aren't going to be there for more and more humans to be around. Uh, and you can see that the growth has decreased. So uh, the growth rate kind of peaked right around what would that be in the 1970s or so and now we're actually dealing with a bit of a decline in growth rate but our numbers are still increasing a larger human population puts increased demands on the environment so for example things like logging mining building uh, lead to increased amounts of pollution so as we get higher and higher uh, population we end up needing more and more resources and so as a result <clears throat> things get destroyed and we end up destroying ecosystems environments habitats in order for us to have the things that we want and need uh, rainforest is especially of concern and the reason why it's a huge concern is because the rainforest is a big carbon sink so when you think about you know uh, plants and wood it takes carbon dioxide and it stores it inside of itself right through the process of photosynthesis so it's taking co2 out of the air uh, it's storing it within the tree as carbon um, in the form of things like cellulose and, and tissues of the tree and so now if we take the rainforest and we end up actually destroying those trees and burning it we're releasing all of that carbon to again the atmosphere to the environment and it's not taking more out of the atmosphere. So it's a huge issue and it's massive, um, you know, habitat for tons of different species. So the loss of even a single area of the rainforest can mean the extinction of specialist organisms. You learn about specialists and the fact that some things have incredibly narrow niches and that they only can survive in one particular place. And the rainforest is full of these specialist organisms. So when you destroy parts of the rainforest, you actually end up destroying as well those specialist organisms that are, uh, you know, in that area of the rainforest. And the rainforest is getting destroyed at a massive rate. Um, just, it's crazy. Uh, part of this has to do with, again, farming and <clears throat> agriculture and lack of policies around clear cutting and burning and protections for the rainforest. Um, the palm industry is a huge part of this. In fact, some people try to stay away from anything that has palm products in it, uh, like palm oil and that sort of thing. And the reason why is because the rainforest is being destroyed in order to grow palm uh, at a large rate. But the destruction of the rainforest is very hard to repair because the soil has very few nutrients, which prevents regrowth of the forest. So once it's gone, it takes an incredibly long time for it to ever get close to where it was. Is it possible for species to become extinct in some areas, but not in others? Yes. This is a uh, tapir, which I, I just found this as an image and I thought it looked bizarrely fun. It's like a mix between like a, I don't even know, what would you say? Like a pig and a dog? It's pig dog, tapir. So, Tapir is an example of something that actually ended up being extirpated from an area. I feel like this was in South America somewhere, but I can't, I honestly don't remember. Uh, but extirpation is the extinction of a species in a geographical region. So it's not extinct everywhere, but it's extinct from one area. So the grizzly bear is a great example. Uh, grizzly bears actually used to be way further south than, um, than they are now. But over time, they went further and further north. Uh, and so that's extirpation because, uh, or extirpation because they are no longer in certain areas. They're extinct in certain areas, but they're not extinct overall. So this is a word that actually comes up a ton on the provincial achievement test uh, is extirpation. And what that means is that it goes extinct from one specific area. It's not extinct overall, but it's extinct from one specific area, one geographical region or location. 
So these are the categories for endangered species and extinction and stuff. So kind of the different levels of where uh, species can be at. So extinct, of course, just means there's none left. And then we actually have uh, extinct in the wild. So this is an example of where an animal maybe exists in zoos and in breeding programs, but there's no longer any in the wild. They're just not present anymore. They haven't survived. Uh, then we have critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. Uh, and then we have near threatened, least concerned, and then where we just have not evaluated or data deficient, we just don't know. Um, so those are some different kind of categories of where we're at. What we're going to be taking a look at later on is looking at these endangered and critically endangered animals. We're going to do some kind of a project on that so we can take a further look at animals that are in danger of becoming extinct or extinct in the wild. So how do we know that an ecosystem is in trouble or that uh, there's problems occurring? Well, we use bioindicator species. There are some species that are very sensitive to changes that take place in the environment, and it allows us to actually see when there's a problem in an ecosystem by looking at the population of that particular species. So a great example is something like even frogs. Uh, if we look at frogs, they are really good bioindicators. And one of the reasons for that is because they have their you know, tadpole part of their life cycle happens in the water. So uh, we can actually see based on the frog population if there's problems in the aquatic environment of an ecosystem because then they won't actually be able to have, you know, the earlier parts of their life cycle occur if there's too much pollutants or problems or whatever happening. So bioindicator species are species that we can look at and count easily the population in order to see if uh, ecosystem is healthy or if there's some kind of danger. And it can help to identify environmental changes like pollution that maybe are causing big impacts. Uh, and then from there, we can make changes to hopefully make it better. One that you're going to learn about later on when we talk about environmental chemistry later on in the year is looking at macro invertebrates in uh, rivers and stuff in lakes, where we actually can take a sample of lake water or river water, and then we can count the macro invertebrates that are present. So macro invertebrates are things like worms and stuff. And then based on what we find, we know then um, if it's healthy water or if it's water that maybe is in trouble or polluted. So any organism that is really sensitive to a change in uh, condition of an ecosystem is a bioindicator species. So this is the uh, macroinvertebrates that I was talking about that can be used to actually see how water quality is. So really briefly to talk about this, if we have really poor water quality, <clears throat> we're going to find things like leeches, uh, midge larvae. But if we have really good water quality, then we'll find things like uh, mayfly larvae, stonefly, like that kind of stuff. We'll find these guys instead. Uh, these are where we have really good water quality and high amounts of oxygen present in that water. Well, these ones can only survive, okay, really only survive if the water quality is bad. So these are great bioindicator species to the left here because they're very sensitive to changes. And if things are going poorly in that aquatic environment, we're not gonna find these in high numbers. And then we know that there's some kind of pollution or problem that's taking place. Like I said, another great example is frogs of different kinds. Because they have that aquatic part of their life cycle and they're easy to count, um, they're also very, very uh, useful. So at the end of this, Hopefully what you've learned is what extinction is, no longer in existence, what extirpation is, which is where it's extinct from one area, one region. Um, how does this affect biodiversity? Well, it lowers it, right? As we end up losing different species, then we end up having lower and lower biodiversity. How does it affect us? Well, that, that's an interesting question. So for you, um, do you care if there's less species on Earth? Uh, is is you know, these species that are going extinct in the rainforest, for example, that maybe we don't even know about. Uh, is there value in trying to save those? Is it something that we should do? Uh, that's, you know, it's an interesting question and maybe all of us have a different answer. There are some people that are incredibly passionate about preserving the biodiversity of our world and making sure that we keep these things around. Um, Will they be beneficial to humans? Maybe, maybe. I mean, sometimes when we look at different plants and organisms, we find compounds in there that are uh, really good for developing new drugs and stuff, right? Like new antibiotics or antivirals. 
uh, or whatever um, and that we find that are being produced in nature by different species. And if we lose those species, then we lose those chemicals and those opportunities. Uh, so, I mean, that's an interesting question to ask and ponder is, does this present value? Is there value in uh, maintaining biodiversity of the world? And, and each of us might have a different answer. What is the importance of bioindicator species? Well, it lets us see if there is an ecosystem that's in trouble. So by looking at bioindicator species and their population, we can get a better picture of whether an ecosystem is having troubles, whether we have uh, pollution taking place, all that kind of stuff. So it tells us more. Um, I wanna go through this review of meiosis and mitosis really quickly, but uh, one other thing that isn't on here is the idea of the introduced species, which is a major concept. And um, what do introduced species do? Well, essentially they end up uh, filling niches in, um, you know, in an ecosystem that normally would be taken by other organisms and there's no predators and stuff so they don't have the same kind of competition their numbers aren't kept in check and as a result they just end up completely throwing an ecosystem out of whack uh, so they you know think about it like this you're hanging out with your friends and somebody comes in and starts talking and joining your friends that is just a super overpowering personality and they take over every conversation they're incredibly loud right and they just kind of ruin the whole time that's, that's an introduced species, okay? That's an invasive species. They're coming in uh, and they're completely just like wrecking your group dynamic. And, and it's the same thing for an ecosystem. If we have an introduced species that doesn't normally exist there, that things haven't adapted to hunt and to compete with and whatever, and they come in, they can just completely take over and get massive numbers and be out of control. And many of the things that are, uh, you know, very, very plentiful that there's too much of in terms of animals. Those are often introduced species. And it's simply, you know, because other things haven't adapted in order to keep that in check, to use it as a food source, uh, to compete with it properly so the numbers stay down, that sort of thing. Okay, mitosis and meiosis. We already talked about this. I actually just kept this in the slideshow because I, uh, on a different year, felt like I didn't cover this well enough. So I thought, hey, let's just keep it in and talk about it again. These are great diagrams. This is meiosis. Again, the idea of meiosis is that when it occurs, it splits into four final daughter cells. When I take a look at this, right, at the very bottom, I end up with one, two, three, four daughter cells. And these four daughter cells are haploid which means that they have half the genetic code. These are gametes, okay? This produces gametes, so sperm or egg. When a sperm and an egg meet up, because they both have half the genetic code, I get then a full genetic code, and that's when it becomes a zygote. Mitosis is everything except for your gametes. This is how new cells are made in your body, um, and new cells made by uh, things like binary fission or whatever, by bacteria. And all that happens is the DNA all gets copied, so all the chromosomes get copied, and then the cell divides into two. And each cell gets a full copy of the chromosomes, of the DNA. So DNA copies in the original cell, then it splits into two, and each daughter cell ends up having a full genetic code. So one, two daughter cells. So some descriptions here, mitosis is division that makes diploid or diploid body cells, 46 chromosomes in humans. Genetic code is completely copied. While in meiosis, it's division that makes haploid gamete cells, 23 chromosomes in humans. Genetic code is mixed and split in half into the gametes it forms. We didn't talk about this mixing portion because uh, that's actually kind of higher level, but there is a process that happens when it's the first cell before it does its first division where chromosomes do something called crossing over which actually um, kind of mixes genetic code between chromosomes. And yeah, anyway, so it actually allows for even more variation than we would normally have. I'm not gonna get into it, but it allows for more variation in gametes than we would have even by the fact that we have 46 chromosomes and you don't know which one is gonna go to the gamete, the mom or the dad one, right? The one that's from your mom or your dad. But then on top of that, we have this mixing of chromosomes that occurs uh, that makes it even more crazy. All right, so that's mitosis and meiosis. Again, mitosis makes two cells that are identical in full genetic code. Meiosis makes four uh, cells, which are not identical in terms of the genetic code they get, and they're haploid, meaning they have half the normal genetic code, half the chromosomes. 
All right. Well, that's it for today. Have a good one.